all, all the leads in the world that you get won't do you much good if you end up dropping the ball on the appointment. So we find that in general, the best agents uh, usually have a good working knowledge of what to say and when to say it. Uh, it's a learned skill. You can learn uh, the different language and uh, answers to pointed objections, internalize them. And don't worry, I know a lot of you are worried about being a robot, uh, a robot like fashion and uh, looking like you're just reciting a, a, a script. But no, if, if you go over it and over it again, practicing it uh, and internalizing it, I can assure you, that when the time comes and they ask you some pointed objection, you'll open your mouth and it'll just come out. And by having a, a credible professional answer ready uh, to address an objection and hopefully prevail and get the business, uh, it, it'll give you that added confidence that uh, you uh, feel self-assured as a professional that you can uh, address any foible, any concern, any hiccup uh, that's going to be uh, brought to your attention and you can answer it in a very effective manner. Now, Please keep in mind, this is important, when talking with a decision maker, buyer or seller, 70% of selling is listening. So if you're just waiting for your turn to talk, going back and forth, you're going to, you might miss hearing what's important to the client. So it's of critical importance that you listen very carefully to uh, pick up on what their concern or main issue would be, and then have the wherewithal to be able to address that in the conversation. What you want to do is get into the habit in the discourse of conversation back and forth with any decision maker, you want to be able to acknowledge what they just said, just to prove out of empathy and respect diplomacy that you heard them. Then with it's still your turn to talk because you they've just finished and you're acknowledging it. We're going to get into all of this as to how to do this. Then you come out with your own logical statement after the acknowledgement because uh, it's now your turn to talk. And you, after acknowledging about how you, they understand that way, you come out with a logical explanation or statement or description that will hopefully have them maybe rethink their position uh, or they see a different uh, avenue to take. And then at the end of your logical statement, you want to instinctively get in the habit of using the occasional tie down where you're asking a little uh, understated, non-threatening question at the end of your statement, uh, such as, do you see how that makes sense? Or do you see how that might be a better course of action? Uh, you know, wouldn't you agree now? you'll have to cherry pick which ones you feel more comfortable with as we go through this today for the one hour lecture some people will say well i don't care for that type of tie down well there are a host of different tie downs so please be assured that if you don't like one there are two or three others you can pick from we're going to go through a, a whole bunch of different pieces of lingo it will become instinctive if you practice it so think of it uh, any appointment that you go on say on a listing presentation not so much a buyer but if you go on a listing presentation i know we're all self-employed but in essence, what you're doing is if you're not referred and you're going in cold where they called you off social media or maybe they've heard of your name or they called off a sign and you go in there Wednesday night at seven o'clock to meet with the decision makers, really in essence, it's a job interview. Now I know you have total autonomy, you're self-employed, you don't think of it being in a job, but just think of the um, analogy. Think back to when, uh, before you were ever in real estate, I think most of us probably worked at a job uh, prior to coming into real estate sales as a profession. Uh, now, if it was a job of any importance, uh, obviously you had to go for the initial job interview to get said job. So think, some of you might have to think back quite a ways and some of you more recent, but think back to the morning of the job interview and you wanted that job, it was important to you, it was valuable to you. Did you just wake up that morning, the appointed day, just shower, put on business attire, and without any practice or rehearsal in your mind, just go in and ad lib your way through the job interview? And probably the answer is no. More than likely, if it was a job of any import, you would probably be doing your own research prior to the interview as to what the current questions are in the private sector, what are more popular appointed questions that uh, interviewees get asked. And you probably in your mind practice fleshing out in your, in your mind how to couch the answer, the wording uh, to come out with a credible answer. And if you managed to practice that where you thought you had an effective response for any interview questions, then it freed you up to walk in with an air of assurance and confidence and professionalism to be able to put your best foot forward, so to speak, because you knew that you had done the research and you were ready. You weren't going to be caught uh, unaware or by surprise on any of the pointed questions being asked of you. So draw the parallel to real estate. When you go in a listing appointment, you know you have a clear agenda of where you want to go 
where the, the game plan, the end game is to walk out with the listing, uh, obviously, but you have to navigate through a host of issues where they could have certain concerns. You're going to qualify the situation, determine their needs, wants, concerns, desires, and you're painting benefit pictures, uh, providing them with beneficial solutions to their concerns or needs. And if they perceive that you have value, even after going over all the commission, et cetera, if they perceive that you have a value that will benefit them accordingly for the concern at hand, then if you ask in the right way, more than likely they will take action with you. And if there's a stall or another objection, then you want to be able to deal with that as well and continue to pursue moving it towards its positive conclusion. You see, remember in real estate sales, when it comes to language skills, it's not what you know, it's what you can remember to say in time. You can never be too proficient at this. There's no realtor in North America with a thousand percent bat ratio. You could be really good at the, at the language skills, have a bit of an off night, draw a blank, uh, not uh, get the business, get back out to your car and slap your forehead saying, you know, I should remember to say such and such. So you can never be too proficient at it. So practice, it's funny, the, the, the saying in life generally is practice makes perfect. No, practice makes permanent. If you practice this enough and internalize it, then it'll be permanent in your memory banks to be able to draw on it as you will. And I think it's, it's really encouraging for your self-confidence level if you have this arsenal or this ammunition uh, ready to uh, grab hold of and uh, use and apply at the right moment. So let's get into it. Uh, don't worry, each of you will be getting the full text of the language I'm about to share with you. It's including chapter four for my book, Dialogues to Success. Uh, you'll be getting all of that after the session is over. Um, we only have time today to address three key objections. Uh, we're doing the one hour uh, lecture. And then uh, after that, uh, we'll have uh, about 20 minutes or so for answering any questions. So I appreciate if you can leave your questions to the end. Okay, so let's just jump right in with the first scenario. Uh, Kyle, if I could just have the first slide on the screen. The idea is that you're at an open house. You're at an open house with uh, uh, people coming through. You're chatting with the one couple walking around. And as they're walking around and you're demonstrating the property, and then uh, you get uh, back to the front foyer, they're about to leave. And you're just, uh, they, they say, yes, we've got a house to sell. Uh, and, uh, they say, but then they pipe, so but, you know, thanks, we have a friend, we're going to be listing with her. Now, this is a common objection, whether it's at an open house, which we haven't done for a while because of the pandemic, but I'm just painting a picture. This is happening where you're at an open house for the public, they're on your turf. Uh, they've walked into your den, uh, you uh, have control of the situation. So you live and in person, look at them eyeball to eyeball, you can put your best foot forward compared to trying to do this over a phone or um, over a, any type of uh, Zoom call. Uh, it could be somewhere else. It, really, the way this language is geared, you could be at a business cocktail party, chatting with somebody that work, uh, lives in your area that you work, and they could pipe up and say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm going to be selling my house. But then they realize they misspoke and they they almost take half a step back saying, oh, yeah, but thanks. I've got a friend. She's a, she's a realtor. I'll be going with her. So it, it doesn't really matter about the environment. Just for showcasing this, we're talking about it being, say, at an open house where you have the advantage of looking somebody eyeball to eyeball. So when they say to you, oh, yeah, we have a friend, uh, it could be a relative, but say, oh, yeah, we have a friend. We're going to be listing with her. Now, if they say that to you, if they said to you, we have a realtor we're going with, you do not use this language. There's another way. But if they say to you, yeah, we're going with a friend, think about it in this huge metropolis we live in, in Toronto. Unless I. Okay. So I hear the recordings back on now. So my commission rate is academic because once you give me the go ahead, unless I accomplish my task, bring an offer where you've allowed for my commission and you net what you want, you don't have to pay me a penny really in essence. So it is academic. So slash is the, is the S, A is for academic, and the R in the third paragraph is risk. Really in essence, when you think about it, I'm the one taking most of the risk, which is a key power word. Once you let me get started, I'm the one doing all the advertising, networking, uh, open houses, promotion, unless I accomplish my task and bring you an offer where you've allowed for my commission and you get the, the price you want, you won't be accepting it. I don't get paid. And I'm not in the habit of working uh, this hard uh, not to get paid. That's the flavor. It. What's he saying? Oh, his internet went down with the worst timing. It's interesting that his internet went down, but as long as we're still getting through to the uh, the staff or to the agents. So, so then the W at the end, besides when all is said and done, you'll find I'm worth the commission rate as I have a proven track record for being a top negotiator. I'm going to look after your best interest at the offer table. Are the type of negotiator you want in your corner when you really think about it? 
Now, it's a very powerful statement, very bold, but really this is the type of person they're looking to sell their house. They don't want somebody introverted and shy and uh, scuff shoes and uh, stoop shoulders saying, well, I think I could do it. No, they want someone tenacious and assertive and forthright saying, yes, I'm proud of the service I offer. And if others are willing to slash their paycheck right up front, how can they protect your asking price? My commission rate is academic. I could be asking for 8% for going on MLS for all that matters. But unless I bring you net what you want after you allowed for that uh, commission percentage, you don't have to accept the offer. You don't have to pay me a penny. So really, I'm the one taking most of the risk. I have to bring you an offer where you're happy with the price that you're willing to accept it, uh, irrespective of whatever the commission rate is, that because you're happy with what you're netting in your pocket. And besides, when all is said and done, I'm worth this commission uh, that I'm quoting because I pride myself on being a top negotiator. And if you can rattle all this off, all this verbiage, and at the end say, I pride myself on being a top negotiator, the, 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 the homeowners might think, well, boy, I bet you she is a good negotiator. She sounds pretty effective to me. So it's a nice piece of language. And I realize that's quite a bit to memorize. But my memory is no better than yours. If I can go through uh, laboring of uh, practicing and rehearsing it in my, over and over, the best way is like an actor learning a script. If you like what you're hearing today and you get the text, if you can print off a hard copy compared to on a computer screen and just hold it in your hand and just read it out loud, you can role play with a friend or a, a colleague. And if you just have the words past your lips, reading it it's like a, an actor learning a script, reading it out loud over and over again, uh, so that the sheer repetition will cause retention of memory, then don't worry, it won't come out in an in a, uh, artificial manner. When you go to answer and you can role play with a colleague to practice this, you'll find that you open your mouth and it just rolls off your tongue. Uh, you'll make it your own. You'll have it go through, uh, it'll transmogrify into being the exact language on the page with your own comfortable vocabulary. It'll become a hybrid where the, 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 the logic, the, the gist, the theme of the logical message will be there. Although I would encourage you, the closer you can get word for word as to the way it's on the, on the page, it would probably serve you well that way. Uh, it'll come across in a more effective, persuasive, impactful fashion. Okay, so. Um, hey, Michael, did you want me to share the screen for you again? Yeah, that's great. Good to have you back, Kyle. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about everyone. My internet went down. Um, okay, yeah. let, me, let me see if I can. Yeah, if you, can, if you can put up the commission one, because I was just explaining it in detail, but uh, if they can see that one. Sure, okay. This one here? Uh, yep, that's it. Thank you so much. Oh, you just, uh, I don't know. Yeah, great. Okay, I'm glad everyone can see this. Now, as I just went through, and you heard the verbal example of it. Um, okay, they say we're going to, you're at the kitchen table. I'm just gonna go over this one more time that you have in front of you. You're at the kitchen table. It could be a sole owner. In this case, I'm just saying it's, it's two partners, two people, uh, a couple that own this piece of real estate or principal residence. You're going through all of your services. You outline your commission schedule. And they say to you, oh, well, yeah, you charge that much. We've talked to ABC last night. Uh, they'll do it for a lesser commission. Uh, I mean, unless you're willing to match them, uh, you know, we're going to go with that brokerage. They charge less commission. I'm, I'm just painting that picture to you of setting a scenario. It could be a host of other uh, things that you encounter this objection. I'm just trying to paint a picture so you can get your, your head around the space of uh, the environment that we're dealing with. So you, you're sitting at the table, you have outlined your services, you table your commission schedule, and then when you outline uh, the schedule, they just say, oh, well, if that's the case, no, we talked to ABC last night. They'll do it for this amount. Uh, we're going to be going with them. They, they, they charge less commission. And they can even say, are you willing to match that? So this is your response. You're saying, I understand, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, why you may feel that way about the commission. And you don't have to work with me. There's the reverse psychology of it. But in your own best interest, there's a very good reason why you may want to reconsider. If you have a moment, I'd be glad to explain. Do you, know, do you have a moment? And you're, you're simply politely negotiating just for maybe 90 seconds to two minutes of their time to have them begrudgingly open their brain, their mind, their mindset to say, well, why? What are you talking about? Because uh, you're saying in your own best interest, good reason why you may want to reconsider. If you have a moment, I'd like to explain it. Okay, begrudgingly, what is it then? And you're saying, well, of course. Commission rates are negotiable. So talk about not dodging the objection. You're dealing with it head on. Commission rates are negotiable. They're not standardized. And I'm not faulting that company. You must put this disclaimer in. You say, I'm not faulting that company you've mentioned in particular. 
Okay, but after you put in that disclaimer, you can then go on to say, but if any realtor, and if you can see me on the camera, you actually sneer a bit, uh, just to act out the, the statement. You actually sneer when you say the word realtor. You say, but if any realtor, and you actually sort of just uh, wrinkle your nose a bit, is so willing to slash their own income right up front, and that's where you speed that phrase up. So you can even act it out when you say, if they're so willing to slash their own income, you make a little power motion with your hand right in front of them. Now, not over dramatically, but you say, if any other realtor is so willing to slash their own income right up front, what do you think that they're doing? And point right at them. What do you think they're doing with your asking price when they're out there and point over your shoulder when they're out there negotiating on your behalf? You know, it's not as if the sellers are going to lean over and kiss you on the cheek and say, holy smokes, you're right where you've been all my life. But it does have impact psychologically where they're thinking, Oh, uh, you know, that's true. If somebody can't negotiate their own paycheck, I mean, how are they protecting our asking price? So what do you think they're doing with your asking price when they're out there negotiating on your behalf? In other words, out there where you can't keep an eye on them. So you're saying besides Mr. and Mrs. Seller, my commission rate is academic because once you give me the go-ahead, unless I accomplish my task and bring you an offer where you've allowed for my commission and you net what you want in your pocket, you don't have to accept the offer and you don't have to pay me anything. Do you see how that makes sense? So you're saying, unless I bring you is the commission rate is academic unless I bring you an offer where you have factored in what the commission rate is and you actually net the amount you want in your pocket. Nobody's going to twist your arm. Nobody's going to uh, pressure you unless of your own volition, you're willing to accept that offer because you're happy with what you net. Then you risk nothing. You don't have to pay me a red cent. It's all based on performance. You have to be happy with the net amount in your pocket. Do you see how that makes sense? And really in essence, third paragraph to fourth paragraph down, really in essence, when you think about it, I'm the one, hand on chest, I'm the one taking most of the risk. Risk is the power word. Once you let me get started, I'm the one doing all of the advertising, networking, open houses, promotion. And unless I accomplish my task and bring you an offer where you've allowed for my commission and you get the price you want, you won't be accepting it and I don't get paid. And I'm not in the habit of working uh, this hard uh, as I do and not getting paid. And besides, when all is said and done, uh, you'll find I'm worth the commission rate as I have a proven track record for being a top negotiator. And I'm going to look after your best interests at the offer table. Pause for a moment. Let that sink in. Aren't I the type of negotiator you want in your corner when you really think about it? Now, that's a very assertive, very strong close. But dealing with this kind of objection, I think you have to take a very firm stance on this and professional in tone. It's not confrontational. It's not threatening. Now, you see how in each paragraph, We've capitalized the power word. The second paragraph down where it says slash, you can see slash is all in uppercase. Then the next paragraph, academic, all in uppercase. Third one down, risk is uppercase. Then the fourth one, worth. So the easy way to remember this whole statement is that you would, judge, if you write it on a piece of paper, S-A-R-W, slash academic risk, uh, worth it. So S for slash, A academic, R for risk, and W, so long before SARS came along as a medical malady, no, we're talking about the acronym SARW, slash academic risk worth it. Now, please be careful. I know this is a fair chunk of language to memorize, but I taught a group about 10 years ago up in Thornhill at a big company where of young new agents and they practiced this and role played it until they knew it in their sleep. And then we met a few days later to see how their appointments went. And this one young lady, she was rather embarrassed. She said, well, I practiced it until I really knew it. And I went to see a for sale by owner and I'm walking around through the house. And, um, you know, we started talking about the commission rate and we were chatting. It was all good rapport. And I had this cold in my mind as to how to say it. She says, I went through slash academic risk. But when I got to the last paragraph, she said, I, I misspoke. I said, besides Mr. Fizbo, when all is said and done, I'm worth the extra commission. She actually stuck the word extra in, in front of the word commission. So she instinctively thought the other one was quoting less commission. So in my case, I guess I'm asking for extra commission. The FISBO got very upset and politely and firmly ushered her from the house and she, didn't, she did not get the listing. So please be careful. A single word betrays a great design. So you want to memorize uh, this uh, outline of what we've described here. As I said earlier, some of you might not have been here for this, but don't worry about sounding like a script. I can assure you from experience that if you like the, the gist of this, if you like the logical explanation you're hearing here, if you after today getting the text in hand, read it out loud like an actor learning script, reading it out loud. And I know it seems mechanical and corny and one dimensional to read it out loud over and over again. But if you do read it out loud over and over again, um, 12 to 15 times, you'll internalize it. 
to become subconsciously competent at it. And then in real life, you could practice with a colleague and role play for the language, practice speaking it back and forth. And you'll find in the weeks, months to come, and then for life, when you get the objection about the commission, the, the logical gist of this will come out incorporated in your own comfortable semantics of your own vocabulary. Uh, the, the, the basic logical theme will be there. Okay, so that's my strongest recommendation. Or when you get this language after today, if you instinctively inherently feel that you might want to massage this a bit to, to couch it in your own comfortable semantics, then just take a hard copy, take a pen, edit it, just maybe tweak it a little bit. Uh, you can cannibalize it a little bit, but please don't butcher and change it too much because otherwise it betrays the intent of the logic to begin with. The basic logical gist of it has to be there. You know, if anybody else is willing to slash their own income, my commission rate is academic. Really, I'm the one taking most of the risk. Don't say all the risk because it's not all the risk, but most of the risk. And besides when all of a sudden I'm worth the commission rate because with a proven track record, I pride myself on being a top negotiator. I'll look after your best interest. Does that sound fair? Do you see how it's in your best interest to have me look after your needs? And there's the little tie down inherently just uh, instinctively asking for acknowledgement. You want to get some kind of feedback as to whether they're following and whether they agree or not. That's what the tie downs are for, to get them in the habit of agreeing with you. See, over the discourse of, say, a, a half hour meeting, if you pepper the conversation with the occasional little innocuous tie down, say, when you agree, or do you see how that makes sense? Or do you see if that's a good, that's a good uh, avenue that we're going to cover? And if you just ask it, peppering the environment with just little tie downs and over 18, 20 minutes, they get into the habit of agreeing saying, yep, yeah, that's good. Yep, that makes sense. If they get into the conditioned habit of agreeing in essence and nodding dutifully at what you're saying, confirming that they think it's all positive in connotation, then at the end, when you close and ask for the order, it almost seems counterintuitive to go against their own programming to suddenly recant and backpedal and say, well, no, no, not if you've gotten them to the accepted habit of the neurolinguistics of agreeing and nodding and saying, yep, that's good. If they give you a whole bunch of yeses or the, yes, that makes sense, then it seems counterintuitive at the end for them to go 180 degrees away from saying, no, no, that's not a good course of action because it doesn't seem to make sense. What did they agree all along for if they don't think it's good at the end? <clears throat> that's uh, the, um, the, the fundamental uh, logic of it. Now, the next uh, slide <clears throat> is one that we're getting in the last few years with mere postings. This is a new piece of language. This is not in my book. Uh, I haven't published the latest edition, but I wrote this out just in the last year uh, and it's dealing with mere postings. I'm not sure if some of you have run into it yet, but you will be running into it where there's a mere posting, a listing on MLS where they're saying it's a mere posting. You, the buyer agent, must contact the seller directly and negotiate your compensation. And some of these people are saying, no, nah, I'm not paying or I'm paying a flat fee of $1,000, but I'm not paying anything. Now, and they're saying there's the objection at the top. <clears throat> I'm not paying you a commission. <clears throat> Pardon me. So here, let's go through the language. You're saying, well, Mr. Fisbo, I know you want to get the most money from the sale of your home, but here's the decision you have to make. My buyer wants to make an offer on your home, and that buyer is under contract to me with a buyer agency agreement where I earn a 2.5% commission fee on any property I sell them. That is a fact. Now, normally this fee is paid on closing for monies received by the seller from the buyer. If you refuse to take this option, my buyer is legally obligated to pay that fee to my brokerage on closing for services rendered. In my experience, if we exercise that option, most buyers find it unsettling to make that payment and often start the negotiations with the seller by immediately reducing their offer price by that amount. Now, people are willing to pay fair market value when they're, they're not willing to pay fair market value when they are obligated to pay that amount of money before the process even begins. Uh, when you look at it objectively, since the buyer agent fee is going to be paid by one of the two parties involved in the transaction anyway, it proves most effective to have the seller address the payment, thus leaving the buyer with the mindset to be more receptive and flexible during the offer negotiations on the property. That is how you achieve a good sale price. Do you see how the average buyer might be turned off psychologically by having to pay a commission fee to purchase a property that they want? <clears throat> now, this is a very logical, effective piece of uh, uh, dialogue or explanation. So look at what you look at exactly. Let's just analyze and dissect uh, how this goes. I'm not paying a commission to a buyer agent. 
you say, Mr. Fisbo, I know you want to get the most money from the sale of your home. Remind them that you understand that what their motivation is. They want to get the most money. Here is a decision you have to make. In other words, you're in control. It's your house, but you have to make a decision. The, my buyer wants to make an offer on your home, and that buyer is under contract to me with a buyer agency agreement where I earn a 2.5% commission fee on any property that I sell them. That is a fact. So right there, you're flat out saying, hey, whatever I sell them, they are obligated to pay me 2.5 for my services. Now, normally, this fee is paid on closing for monies received by the seller from the buyer. If you refuse to take that option, my buyer is legally obligated to pay that fee to my brokerage on closing for services rendered. Now, in my experience, if we exercise that option, most buyers find it unsettling to make that payment and often start the negotiations with the seller by immediately reducing their offer price by that amount that they know that they have to pay. So people you know, are not prone to want to pay fair market value when they are obligated to pay the, that amount of money before the process even begins. If they already know they're getting, uh, taking a hit for 2.5% for services rendered, then who's going to be in the, the mood to want to pay top dollar? So when you look at it objectively, since the buyer agent fee is going to be paid by one of the two parties involved in the transaction anyway, see how it's ital italicized? Anyway, it proves most effective to have the seller address the payment thus leaving the buyer with the mindset to be more receptive and flexible during the offer negotiations on the property. That is how you achieve a good sale price. Do you see how the average buyer might be turned off psychologically by having to pay a commission fee to purchase the property they want? Now, this is a lengthy piece of language. If you have the email from the seller saying direct contact is required for negotiation, even if you want to type that out and send it out to, to them, it's pretty bulletproof as to uh, the way it explains everything uh, pragmatically that uh, they might want to consider absorbing it in the total sale price. And it's a very logical, pragmatic explanation, of, which is true. It's not hot air or rhetoric. It is true that if a buyer knows that they're on the hook uh, for a legal commitment of 2.5% on closing, then who would, if you were the buyer, would you be in a mindset then of wanting to uh, almost overpay for a property? Now, I know we're in the Wild West now where prices are going for way over. Well, this certainly doesn't help any efforts of uh, wanting to come in uh, over asking if you're already uh, paying a 2.5 out, uh, out the door, to, out of your pocket. Now, this is an objection we're getting in the last couple of years. The other two I addressed prior about we're going to go with another realtor or we're going to go with a broker that'll do it for less commission. Those are the two granddaddies objections that have been around for decades. Uh, they've always been around, probably always will be around. So out of today's discussion, all three have good merit, but if you want to really embrace the first two about we're going to go with another agent or we're going to go with a broker that'll do it for less commission, that's what you tend to get uh, three times out of five or you know, seven times out of 10 practically. So if those are the two main objections we get the majority of the time in our uh, uh, travels, then if you can become proficient at overcoming those two pointed objections, then obviously it'll help your efforts and your income will go up commensurately. See, prior to us discussing this today, you've got the old chestnuts where when they say we're gonna go with another uh, uh, agent or another realtor, it's always been around where you could say, well, you know, it's the biggest investment you own. You might want to get a second opinion. And that's short and sweet and to the point. Nice grassroots comment. And it might nudge them. Uh, but you can give the expanded answer what we just shared with you a, a short while back, which is more fulsome in uh, pushing their buttons and having them uh, possibly uh, be tempted to listen to what you have to say. And as far as for, uh, you know, the commission, you know, you're, compared to just standing there and looking at somebody saying, well, we're going to go with less commission. And you say, well, you get what you pay for and all this other tired one dimensional rhetoric, uh, the commission thing where you're saying slash academic risk and I'm worth the commission, very comprehensive, all encompassing. And it does come across in a very business like manner in that understated, non-threatening tone. It's a very matter of fact saying uh, as a consummate professional, here's how our industry works. And this is what we're looking at for the nuts and bolts of it. And uh, do you see how this makes sense? And you're asking them, remember the little tie down questions will become instinctive as you go along. Now, I went along at a fairly good pace. Uh, I'd like to just stop at this point and just start to get into some questions. Uh, do you have any questions about, let's go through the first one. The first one being, 
we have a friend in real estate. We're going to be going uh, with her. Let's address that one first. If we, Kyle, if we could put that one back up on the screen about uh, the friend. Uh... Is that the first one? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the first one, yeah. Just need to reduce a bit, yeah, great. So open to questions. Um, if As you read through that, do you have any questions uh, about any piece of that verbiage that you have a concern about, or is there anything you wanna have me clarify as you read through it? I don't know if we lost a few people, but. Uh, no, still a few here, uh, no questions yet. Okay. Well, I did uh, go over it a few times explaining and uh, expanding on it in uh, detail. And I appreciate you all listening uh, with rapt attention, uh, but looking at it again, don't forget your tone of voice uh, counts for a good part of it that you wanna be empathetic in tone. You can't sound hard nosed or overbearing or pressure oriented. So at the top, when you're saying, you know, we're going to uh, go with an agent or we're going with a friend of ours. Oh, does she work this area? Maybe I know her. What's her name? Oh, it's Mary Johnson. And you just struggle a little bit with it. Well, you don't even recognize this person is innocuous. It doesn't really have any impact. Yeah, you don't get into any insults, just saying never heard of her or anything. You just say, oh, okay. And, you, and then you just treat it. Well, obviously she doesn't work this neighbor. That's the intonation of what you're putting forward with your non-response. So your very first part is where you don't even know their name, maybe at an open house, but you're saying, well, tell me, if you felt I was the type of agent who could actually get you more money in your pocket net than this other person, and you point your thumb over to that empty realm, would you at least consider using my service instead? And you can reiterate, say, if I could prove to your satisfaction, would you at least consider it? And then at the end, you're saying, after all, it's the largest piece of equity most people own a lifetime. Now, if you don't even like that part, that second part, you can leave it off. You can just leave it to the first part saying, tell me, if you felt I was the type of agent who could actually get you more money in your pocket net than this other person, would you at least consider my services if I could prove it to your satisfaction. And that's the tie down at the end, reiterating only if I could prove it to your satisfaction. And what are they gonna say? What if, what, if you could prove that you could do a better job? Uh, well, in other words, who wouldn't consider that? If, if I thought I could pick a realtor that could do a better job, then yes, who wouldn't be tempted? But if they stick to their guns because of the social obligation of commitment to the friend, where they say, no, we promised her. As I said earlier, most realtors give up at that point saying, here's my card. If it doesn't work out, please keep me in mind but you push through the veil of fear because you're about to have them walk away and you get nothing anyway. There's no harm in continuing to prevail where you say, well, and it says, I appreciate, I might supplant that with, I understand. I understand, I think it's more respectful and empathetic in tone. You say, I understand how you might feel obligated to this person. Uh, I would tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. If you allow me 20 minutes, let me explain to you how I sell houses for top dollar. One or two things will happen. One, you'd allow me to represent you or two at the very least, you could pick up some extra tips on how to promote your house, your property more effectively. Tips you could pass along to this other person to get you more exposure in your house and more money for you in your pocket. Does that sound fair? And that's the punchline to the whole thing. So you're saying, look, at the very least, I'll make a deal with you. If you allow me 20 minutes, let me explain to you how I sell houses at the top dollar. One or two things, nice to have choices. One, you'd allow me to represent you. You're masterfully in control. Or two, you could pass these tips along to this other person, point over to the empty realm where they could use it to get more exposure on your house. And just to expand on this, I don't know if you can see me on the camera, but you actually make a half moon circle motion with your hand when you say, or two at the very least, you could pass this information along to this other person who would use those tips to get more exposure on your, on your house. And visually making a half moon circle motion back and forth visually denotes more exposure. You could pass this information along to this other person who could use those tips to get more exposure on your house. And then you put your hand forward reassuringly and say, and more money for you in your pocket. And you point your palm towards them and, and it'll get you more money in your pocket. Does that sound like a good idea or does that sound like a good course of action? And there's the tie down at the end. Well, let me ask the question then. When I keep emphasizing about giving a beneficial uh, explanation as you have, and at the end using a little tie down saying, do you see how that makes sense? Or does that sound like a good course of action? Is there anyone here that ha has any discomfort with the idea of using a little tie down question at the end? If anyone has any questions, you can just type it in the chat. So you can click the little chat button and then it'll, it'll pop up and you can type in a question or you can just unmute yourself and, uh, and ask a question. See, while we're waiting, 
the one reason I'm asking. Mm -hmm. So one thing I was going to add is, you know, when you, when you if you get your 20 minutes and they agree to that, uh, make sure you have your listing presentation ready, uh, like in our other video on listing presentations, and uh, that'll help you a lot if you if you if you at least can present, you know, what you can offer on a listing, um, then and you'll have more confidence to ask for it as well. You know, your presentation is ready to go, and you can you know you can bring that with you. And Kyle brings up an excellent point because that's why we did this in the chronological order of covering list and presentation first. Studies show that if realtors don't feel that they're prepared to tell a good story at the listing presentation, then they pull their horns in. They don't instinctively want to do much prospecting because if they get a lead and an appointment, they might actually have to tell their story. So we wanted to give you a very impactful story to tell on your listing presentation. Then this would give you the encouragement to go out and put out more feelers and get more leads because you know that if you get to the environment to sit at the kitchen table and do your listing presentation, you'll be in a position to put your best foot forward. <coughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And the reason yeah. I'm at the reason I'm asking about the tie down and waiting to hear a response is that I can't tell you the number of seasoned realtors I've met over many of these last few decades all across Canada. Even seasoned good realtors who make the mistake of they'll be in a d debate discussion with a decision maker, a buyer or a seller, where the seller, for example, will give an objection and the realtor will give an acknowledgement saying, "Well, I understand how you feel that way. And then they come up with a logical statement explaining how they should rethink it, but they don't do a tie down at the end of it. I'm amazed even 20 year veterans make this mistake where at the end of the full beneficial explanation, uh, persuading the decision maker to reconsider their position, the veteran agent doesn't even ask a little question saying, do you see how that makes sense? Or do you see how that's a better course of action? And by not asking the question at the end, compelling the decision maker to give you an answer, you've now allowed the decision maker to seize control of the conversation and continue to steer it where they want to their own uh, conclusion. No, it's criminal and commission sales for the rest of your career to the best of your ability in the discourse of conversation back and forth. You don't have to use a tie down every time because then it becomes overt and obvious, but just get into the comfortable subconscious habit and uh, skill of you can steer a conversation anywhere you want, even socially. You could be at a cocktail party and as you're chatting with people, instead of just making flat statements, uh, in response, you could make a statement, but then at the end of it, just ask a little question. Well, and, and why did you ever get into that line? You know, what, what intrigued you about going into that occupation? And you could steer a conversation wherever you want and get as much information for people because people love talking about themselves. And you could have people elaborate and they walk away from the encounter saying, well, he was interesting to chat with. Uh, I enjoyed talking to him because they got to talk about themselves. So you can, you can uh, steer and coordinate any conversation you want, whether it's social or business. That's why tie downs are important. Do you, do you all see how that makes sense? And that's me doing a tie down at the end to get you to agree with me. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, as you can just say something simple and whatever, do, do it up to your own personal style. Um, start out right. with these, with these uh, uh, scripts and then, and then later when you get more comfortable, you can maybe adjust it to your own style a little bit more. Um, you know, it's something like, uh, does, does it make sense? I mean, does that make sense? You know, something, whatever, whatever. Uh, you just have to be, um, in their face, so you can just say something that uh, just allows them to agree with you. And that's right, Kyle. I think you were off the internet. Uh, yours went down for a short while. Right in the middle, I was explaining in uh, detail exactly what you just mentioned, that we don't expect you to be uh, like a robot rattling this off uh, letter perfect. If you just internalize it and uh, you uh, meld it with your own comfortable semantics vocabulary, you'll find that the basic gist of the theme of the logic of the message will come out. You'll, you'll make it your own, but at least it's got the, 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 the main core of the logic to it, uh, which is the important part. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the main strategy of where you want to direct the conversation to, to get a successful outcome. Right. If you don't have a blueprint in your mind or a map as to where to go to the logical conclusion, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you're in a chat, a discussion back and forth with a decision maker and you don't have a clear agenda of a map or a blueprint of where you want to go with this, it's not as if if you're off on a tangent the consumer is going to say, well, by the way, we're off on attention here. Let's get back to getting us listed on paper. If you don't bring it back to its conclusion of uh, the game plan, they're not going to bring it back online for you. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is uh, like um, the core of sales skills is to just communication. Right. The whole definition of an effective salesperson, not just indigenous to real estate, but any product or service 
in essence, a good or really a top effective salesperson is someone that knows how to build rapport with decision makers, qualify what their needs, wants, concerns are, then do a presentation painting benefit pictures, providing effective solutions uh, to the needs, wants, concerns, and then know how to close and ask for the order at the end of the entire demonstration in a low-key understated non-threatening fashion. And if, you, if, they, if the decision maker perceives a benefit or a value in your services, that you're worth the commission being quoted because they perceive that they're going to get more monetary gain in their pocket and you come across in a professional manner and ask for it in a non-threatening way at the end, they will tip in your direction a good portion of the time. Not every time, but you'll get your fair share. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so yeah, I encourage everyone to take a look at the other videos that we have on the YouTube channel as well. Um, they're all one hour long. And we do them every month, so you can uh, you can tune in each month, and uh, I'll send out emails to notify everyone what days and times those are. Um, you can also get Michael's book, and that has everything in it. He's going to send the uh, the fourth chapter for free to anyone who wants that, and um, and then you can you can order his book at uh, it's at realestatelanguage.com. Is that is that correct? That there's that way even easier. If anybody interested wants to invest uh, in the book, uh, you just simply uh, go on Treb to e-commerce. You can order the book through Treb. Okay. Yeah, great. And great. that'd be the easiest way for you to get it. Uh, I've always had very nice feedback on it. It is a bestseller in uh, North America for uh, real estate uh, objection handling language skills. Uh, I'm very gratified at the feedback. But before, um, can we just go to the next slide though, uh, Kyle? I just want to go to the next one about the commission. Sure. Yep. Now, this is a very effective response. I'm, I painted the picture that you're sitting at the kitchen table. They say, oh, this other company, ABC, will do it for less. Uh, will you do it for less? Now, I also teach a two-hour course on how to commission a good agent. We get into every dynamic about the commission argument. This is the language. This is part of what we shared during that two-hour seminar, because we only have so much time today. But this is a very effective response. Uh, I ran this language years ago past the top of instructor. I said, is this legal? And about, you know, slash academic risk. And he read it. This is an instructor of 20 some odd years. And he winced. He goes, well, you're pretty close to the bone. But yeah, that, that's OK as long as you say it that way. I said, that's all I need to know. Uh, so I've got to caution you. You've got to be very careful, especially when the very first part where you're saying about the second paragraph down, you're saying, of course, commission rates are negotiable, which is flat out addressing the objection. And I'm not faulting that company you mentioned in particular. And it's then you get into where you're making a pointed observation. If any realtor is so willing to slash their own income right up front, but you've got to put in the disclaimer up front, I'm not faulting any company or realtor in particular, but in general, if any realtor is willing to slash their own paycheck, their own income right up front, what do you think they might be doing with your asking price when they're out there negotiating on your behalf? Which is true. If somebody can't even negotiate their own paycheck, how are they going to have the skills to go out and wrestle to the, uh, on paper a top dollar amount? It, it seems counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And then and does everybody understand academic? I taught this a couple of years ago out in Oshawa, and I had a young agent say, what, what does academic mean? So I had to explain it to him. So I, I think we're all fine here with uh, academic. It's like a hypothetical, you know, it means that you don't have to worry about it unless it actually takes place. You know, you only have to pay me if you get the amount you want net in your pocket. See, that's the funny thing with advertising. We, we think of it as self-evident, but I've seen agents with flyers and brochures coming, putting it out in the market area saying, remember, retain my services. Unless we sell a prop your property for a price you're happy with, you don't have to pay us a penny. You don't have to pay us a dime unless you get a price you're happy with. And some consumers think that's rocket science. They go, wow, what a great deal. I don't have to pay anything uh, unless I get a price I'm happy with. Well, that's always contingent on the way our industry works. We know that as a given, but it seems like uh, rocket science to some consumers that they're saying, you mean I, I, I'm not on the hook for any payment unless I get a price I'm happy with? Yeah, that's right. That's my guarantee. Well, it's, it's all of our guarantee. Somebody has to, of their own volition, sign an agreement to purchase a sale with a price they're happy with. Otherwise, they don't pay anything. So it's amazing how that you can use that as a hook to pull uh, people in saying, yeah, hire me. And unless I get a price you're happy with, you pay me nothing. Does that sound fair? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, exactly. That and especially when you uh, uh, like to accentuate your, your negotiation skills and your, your knowledge of the market. And uh, especially in these times now where there's uh, multiple offer situations, I've seen um, listings go a couple hundred thousand over the asking price. 
So you don't want to go with someone who can save you, I don't know, five or 10,000 on, on a listing price when there's the negotiation skill can get you one or $200,000 more than someone who doesn't have the skills to generate a multiple offer situation or does not handle it properly or doesn't know the, the true value and, and all these things. So you have to really try to explain to the, uh, the client that, that those skills are way more valuable. And it's not about what you're, you're charging up on, on your fee. It's what's, what's they're going to get into their pocket at the end. So that's the, the total. Uh, and the commission's a small, very small part of it in the actual uh, reality. Yeah, the analogy, um, it's where they say, you make how much money for you know, selling it in just a few days. And it always reminds me in the US, there's a top surgeon where uh, in the private sector where he would charge $50,000 for doing a four hour operation. Somebody says 50,000 for four hours. He says, no, you're paying me for the 17 years. It got me to be that good during those four hours. Right, right. So yeah, exactly. you know, if I, yeah, so if I can bring all my skill to bear for my years in real estate and during that one evening, I can orchestrate getting you another hundred thousand dollars in your pocket. You see how that off, uh, more than offsets any commission that you'd be concerned about. Yeah, yeah. There's like little tips and tricks that sometimes you can't even really explain because you're uh, you're, you're so used to doing it and, and uh, um, little things and they all add up into getting you, you know, maybe three offers where another agent who wasn't trying as hard or didn't know those little things maybe only got one offer. And then if you have three, of course, you're going to get above asking rather than uh, something below asking. So there's, there are big things to think about. And uh, it's just, you have to figure out exactly how you're going to explain the way, how your style of how you, how you sell and uh, what your, your, style of uh, selling properties are and your experience and all that kind of stuff. And that's all going to be in the listing presentation as well. Um, but uh, that's really important. And, and just try to sharpen the sales skills as much as you can. That's, that's the biggest advice because that's your biggest tool. And that's uh, the whole profession here is uh, basically sales skills. Yeah. And you can never be too proficient as I've been emphasizing. And if we can just go to the last slide, uh, Kyle, because what Kyle just mentioned ties in nicely to uh, when you talk about multiple offer situation, look at these mere postings. Talk about penny wise and pound foolish. They're actually just trying to save a bit of a percentage. And meanwhile, if they're uh, giving a hard time to every buyer agent coming in the door, good luck trying to orchestrate a multiple offer situation. They may have access to MLS, but the, they're not going to catch lightning in a bottle and have seven offers the same night if uh, they're running roughshod over every buyer agent, uh, stonewalling them for uh, compensation on their fee. Uh, so this is a new piece of language, as I emphasized. Uh, you're going to get the copy of this. It's separate from my book, but uh, th this is for our times. It just shows you how the industry changes. Ten years ago, we didn't have to worry about a piece of language like this, but then mere postings came along. So we had to come up with uh, this new type of uh, response to it. So being fairly new for a piece of language, um, as you read through this, let me, let me extend the invitation. Anybody look participating right now, as you read through that practical business-like uh, explanation of why uh, the seller should rethink their position, can anybody suggest how to tweak it and make it better? You see, I keep emphasizing about painting benefit pictures. Well, in essence, in order to paint a benefit picture, you have to use a certain amount of paint to paint the picture. I wish I could come up with an answer that would be 30 words compared to 130 words, but you, it takes a certain amount of paint to get the point across to the, to the uh, decision maker. If we can make this more concise, but I have edited this and massaged it down to, in essence, a very practical explanation. Well, I didn't even check ahead of time. Kyle, do you think this is a reasonable explanation to give to a, a, a seller? Did you read it earlier? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty good. It's pretty concise. I would say, uh, well, it points out how they might be doing themselves a disservice because it's true. If a buyer has to pay a commission separate right up front, they're not going to be much of a mood to pay top dollar. Yeah, like on these ones, the way that I usually explain it to them is uh, by explaining the power of the MLS system and uh, and even our exposure as a brokerage. It goes out to all kinds of agents' websites. and uh, But uh, MLS, like just, just focus on MLS if you're going to just do uh, for sale by owner, it's a sign out front and maybe like on some small website and uh, MLS gets like the most viewers. There's millions and millions of viewers that are uh, going to see this listing and that's where you're going it, to, it's all marketing, right? It's sales and marketing to sell someone's house. So you want to put it on the network where everyone sees it and this is how you're going to get multiple offers 
or the highest price, like by by one off by one person. The more people that see it, the more chance you're going to get for uh, the, the person that really wants the house. That's and, and the person who can really afford the house. So it just has that, to, it's a numbers game. And that's that's uh, persuading them to move away, say, mere posting to full service. But also this explanation, if they've already gone to a mirror posting and they're out there, but they're arguing that they don't want that they don't want to pay uh, uh, two point five percent to the buyer agent, this is explaining to the seller directly as to why they are doing themselves a disservice. Because if you don't pay the two point five, Mister Seller, I'm going to have to get it from my buyer. And human nature, if the buyer knows that they have to pay two point five, they're not much of a mindset or a mood to then want to pay top dollar for your property because they've already taken his uh, a psychological hit. Uh, and having to already make a payment uh, before even negotiating the price. So it's much better if it's part of the proceeds paid out by the seller. That's the logic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mere posting, that's just going to put you on MLS. But there's so many uh, tricks and um, things you need to do in order to get a multiple offer situation going and then give every agent another chance. And, you know, you can eventually go from one or two offers up to 10, 12, 15 offers and I don't think uh, just a mere posting that agent's not going to have basically nothing to do with it, and they're they're going to leave you to do all the negotiating as the as the seller client. And I don't think that they have the education in order to be able to pull an extra fifty to hundred thousand mm -hmm. out of that situation if they if they were, we were able to uh, garner multiple offers, right? So. Um, okay. it's, 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 yeah, it all ties together where it's, it's, it just comes down to the skill and you're paying a small price to get the, the skill and the, and the, the experience of a top agent. Okay. Now we covered these three main objections today. You're getting a chapter from my book, but as an example of skills and just being ready for an answer, uh, I'll throw out the open invitation. We don't have a big group here today, but does anybody have another objection that you'd like to address right now? And I'll give you an example of the flavor of an answer. Uh, uh, in residential real estate, what would be another example of an objection you, you've been getting in your travels? I'll be glad to address it. Okay, let us know guys, if you if you wanna chat, uh, go to the chat box, um, you just press on the little chat button and the <clears throat> uh, box will come up, you can type it in or you can unmute yourself. Just press the uh, little unmute button. There's like a microphone button on the corner there. You can unmute and you can ask. Get us unmute and just ask uh, with audio. Uh, that'd be the best way. Mm -hmm. yeah, we don't have too many uh, with us today. I think the, the internet problem didn't help. And maybe March break, some people might be, oh, there's one down at the bottom. Let's just see. How is it a good time to sell if I can't find anything to buy? Okay, that's quite common. Yeah. Now, it's, that's, a, that's a, almost an objection. It's also a concern, which is a valid concern that right now, obviously, if they're not gonna be able to find something, uh, you're going to have to be patient with these people and explain to them in detail that during a tight market shortage of inventory out there, that if they're looking for something unusual, then it could be uh, very challenging for them. Whereas if the type of property they're looking for is fairly straightforward, say a four bedroom, two story, 2,800 square feet, double car garage, and there it's going to be a smattering of inventory coming up, then you have to uh, psychologically prepare them saying, then we have to move very quickly. Uh, you have to have the funds ready uh, to be able to do a certified deposit check. Uh, we're going to move in a very prompt fashion where more than likely be a multiple offer situation when the time comes and we're ready to pull the trigger on this. It has to be that within a matter of just a few hours that we meet, make your decision, write up the paperwork, have the certified check ready, so we can put our best foot forward going in and campaigning against probably a number of other offers. I'll, I'll counsel you at that time how many offers we're up against and we'll map out a strategy. But mainly that's where you have to coach and educate them as to uh, be uh, a, a team player ready to take quick effective action when the time comes. Not, there's no so much fancy language for addressing that. It's more of explaining the nuts and bolts of them as to the process. And it is challenging right now. It's hard to, uh, this is why right now in this market, I tell you a good category for going for listings is if you can target where people aren't so much buying at the end, they could be at a stage in life where they finally want to liquidate empty nesters, get their top dollar amount out and maybe downsize to a rental. Not everybody's buying again. They could be moving in somewhere else where it's rental or assisted living or whatever else. This, If anybody ever wanted to cash out, 
uh, being an end user and then sell it and take their funds and, and keep it liquid and move into a rental. Uh, a number of those are gonna, in the next 90 days are going to be popping up on the market. It's a question of targeting and finding out who they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, good question, Gary. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so my encouragement and suggestion or invitation is that after you get the text today, that'll be sent to you. Please read through it while it's fresh in your mind. If you want to tweak or massage and edit it a bit to change it into your own verbiage, then you're welcome to do so. Just don't change it too much because then it cannibalizes the, uh, the intent of the message. Uh, it's really, our feedback is ego aside, it's very good language for the Canadian market. It's not too strong in tone. It just comes across in a very pragmatic, uh, common sense uh, type of uh, explanation on every subject matter. Uh, as far as now, we're right in the heart of the spring market. Here we are, March, April, May into June. Uh, for the next 90 days, this is the, the key time to be working at optimum performance. I know it's the Wild West out there. It's really a frantic, crazy market, no inventory. But right now, the consumers at large really have the mindset of wanting to take action over these next few months. So you, you should be working at peak performance uh, for uh, optimum, optimum effort. Uh, I think is from what I understand in another month, next month, uh, the next uh, webinar we'll probably cover 30 sales tips that'll help facilitate your efforts. Kyle, yeah, is that, sure. that sounds like a good topic. Yeah, let's do that one next. That sounds great. Otherwise, it's great that we're all part of the same great broker, the international uh, realty firm. Uh, I guess we have our big event coming up on the 20... 24th, yeah, 7 p.m. 24th at 7 p.m. I look forward to uh, meeting some of you live and in person after this two-year uh, hiatus, and uh, good to see each other in person. Otherwise, we're all with the same great company. Uh, my very best wishes for getting out there and getting some good inventory, and we'll see you at the next uh, webinar. Yeah, great. Sounds good, guys. And I uh, just wanted to make one more point. Like uh, The sales skills is the most important thing as we're, uh, we're realtors, we're agents, but really uh, the, 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 title, the job title for most of us is salesperson or sales representative. So just keep that in mind and uh, the real estate knowledge is important, but I think even more important is, uh, especially when you're beginning and you're starting in this, in this career, uh, sales skills. So there's, there's uh, Michael's book, Dialogues to Success is great. Uh, there's uh, Brian Tracy writes some really good uh, sales uh, stuff. Uh, Tony Robbins, it, it depends on, on who you like, on what your style is. Um, try, try Brian Tracy, try Tony Robbins. Um, Blair Singer does some good stuff as well. So also Ninja Selling is a good book. Ninja Selling. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, have a have a good uh, day, and uh, we'll see you uh, at the event and on, on our next video. Okay. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.